First of all, I want to say how blessed I feel and how honored I am to be here with my brother from another mother. I don't know if he's always been bald like me. But uh, I'm going to ask you to bring it up a little bit, please. Uh, I remember when I started going bald, I fought it. I grew, I grew my hair long, and then I'd flip it forward and... <clears throat> style it like an afro but it got to be too stressful always having to walk backwards in the wind <laughs> so I kind of left that alone I'm glad to be here even though I'm away from my home church I've been pastoring the church I'm in for the last 18 years, Palm Bay, Florida. And uh, I'm honored to have my wife, Linda, with me today. We're the only black diamonds I know on Delta. Black diamonds, okay. And then my sons, my oldest son, Wintley and Winston, we're so, I'm so happy to have you here today. Now at my church, I, I always try to sing a song before I speak, and so I'm going to do that. And I wrestled with what I was going to do, so I'm going to reach back kind of go back in the archives. All right? Listen to the message in the song. I hope you're blessed. Thank you, Lord. Light up the sky of days when life for me meant holding on, hoping that I would be strong, always needing more to see that somehow I would surely find my way. By faith, I'd see a brighter day. I believe in the clouds and I believe in rain. I believe in miracles and I believe that your love will always be the same. I believe the sun will shine again now I live in confidence I know the God above believes in me he touched my life and now I see that I'm a portrait of his love created in his image here I stand my life together in his hands and I believe in the clouds and I believe in rain I believe in miracles and I believe that your I 
believe the sun will shine again. I believe, I believe, and I believe in the clouds, and I believe in rain, I believe in miracles, and I believe that your love will always be the same. sun will shine again the sun will shine Father, thank you for hope that in the dark days we can believe that the sun will shine again. As I open your word, dear God, I ask that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Fill my life with your Holy Spirit's presence and power. Speak to me, through me, and for me. I promise you, God, I'll always give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. amen. And amen. Thank you, Lord. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of John, and you can stand if you wish in honor of the reading of God's word. The book of John, chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. The word of God says, When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Please be seated. The older I get, the more I don't wear watches. So I'm just going to preach until Jesus says stop. After spending the night in the Mount of Olives, Jesus returned to the temple to continue his ministry. As the people gathered about him, Jesus sat down and began to teach. It was not long before a commotion was heard near the back of the temple, interrupting his flow of discourse and dialogue. Everyone was astonished as a group of Pharisees with pious frowns rudely dragged a terrified woman through the crowd. And that angry, self-righteous mob 
threw a disheveled woman down at the feet of Jesus. Her heart was racing, her face was twisted with fear. Etched across her brow were lines of distress and terror. She knew the punishment for adultery was death. And this poor woman believed that this would be her last day on earth. But here she was, not long from her bed of sin, lying crumpled and broken at the feet of Jesus. Little did this woman know that her accusers had deposited her at the feet of grace and mercy. Help me, Lord Jesus. They had dumped her at the feet of the Savior of the world. She was so frightened she couldn't see that all this drama the Pharisees created was not about her. Uh, this was staged hypocrisy. <laughs> this was theological theatrics all being acted out to steer Jesus into a doctrinal ambush. You see, in the Mosaic law, when there was adultery, the woman was not to be singled out. In the law of Moses, both the adulterer and the adultery, that's, that's a new word I just made up, don't look for it in your scrabble. <laughs> Both of them were to be stoned and punished equally. So that means if they had caught her in the act, in the bed, what happened to the man? Aren't you glad we, we're beyond some of that nonsense of unequal focus? There was a time when it wasn't so equal, y'all. In the law of Moses, singling out the woman was both unlawful and unauthorized. And frankly, it was a setup. And the man was nowhere to be found. Those Pharisees thought they were so erudite and so smart. They thought they had Jesus in an intellectual and theological dogma trap. But my Bible tells me in 1 Corinthians 1.24 that Christ is the wisdom of God. That means to me no matter how quick your thinking or how shrewd your scheme, my God is always ahead of you. Will you let me praise my God for a minute? My Bible tells me every breath you breathe, you ought to praise him. The word of God tells us that Jesus is the wisdom of God. That means to me, no matter your theories or hypotheses, no matter your presuppositions or closely held opinions, you can't spar with God's transcendent intellect. No matter your live queries or your dead-end questions, no matter your title or training, your level of scholarship or career preparation, you can't confound God's wisdom. You can't outwit God's creativity. No matter your philosophy or cosmopolitan sophistication, you can't outrun his brain and brilliance. You can, are you with me today? You can't outmatch his aptitude nor ability. You can't outmaneuver his will. Your mind is still too short to box with God. Have mercy, God. I'm going to get happy all by myself up in here. In the book of Isaiah, God says, you're not God and you'll never be God. Yeah, that's what he said in Isaiah 44, verse 8. God says, I'm God all by myself. God says, is there another God besides me? He said, I know not any. 
He said, I've walked the halls of Orion. I've vacationed in the Pleiades. I've paid courtesy visits to every planet. And if there is another God, he hasn't shown his face. Not to me. Have mercy, God. Is it all right if I just act like I'm in my own home church for a minute? I came to remind somebody that my God has no rivals. He has no competitors. Hallelujah. He has no peers, no equal. He's God all by himself. He's omnipotent, all powerful. And who are we? Animated dust. Who can barely stand up on our own. Close your eyes at night to get a rest. He never sleeps or slumbers. By the time you open your eyes in the morning, God is way ahead of you. Before you walk out the door, he knows what you're up to. And he has your steps in his vision. Before you figured out where you're going, he's already been there and back. You, you, you can't match the mind of my God. And then even, even though this story happened long ago, I got to tell you, when I read it, it's real to me. You see, I can't help it. I, I too, am a sinner born and bred. <laughs> and even when I walk uprightly, I'm leaning. I can't change my sinful past. And I don't know about you, but I'm well aware that everything I ever needed to do to be lost, I've already done it. And like that woman at the feet of Jesus, I too see myself a guilt-ridden sinner reeking with the stench of shame and self-recrimination. I too see myself at the feet of Jesus drowning in dishonor and disgrace, unfaithful, disloyal, treacherous, two-timing, unworthy with a death sentence hanging over my head. And still in my frailty and sinfulness, I find myself asking God, how is it that you can trust me when I know I can't be trusted? Those Pharisees stood there waiting for the reaction and response of Jesus to that trick question. And then without answering or debating, Jesus looked into the eyes of her accusers. He read their sin-filled histories, <laughs> the every tent, intent and motive of their hearts. And then Jesus stooped down and the Bible says began writing with his finger on the ground. You, you know, that same finger that wrote on tablets of stone on the back of Mount Horeb. <laughs> that same finger that wrote words of judgment on the walls of Belshazzar's palace. That same finger, help me Lord, reached down in the dust and began to write the sins and iniquities of that woman's accusers. He stopped writing for a moment and then looked up at the Pharisees and said, He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And then he began writing some more. Church, I, I can see him, I can see him now writing a M I R Amir saw a prostitute five times in Midian. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I can see Amir blink in disbelief and he starts backing up. <laughs> and, and Jesus continues to write, Jared been stealing money from the temple coffers for the last 15 years. And, and then Jared starts to back up and, and he continues to write Ira and Ephraim several one night stands in Midian details too shameful to write 
And then Ira and Ephraim start backing up. Anybody here know today Jesus will make your enemies back up? Oh yes, I know what I'm telling you. He'll make your enemies leave you alone. My God said, come sit down at my right hand. I'll make your enemies your footstool. Anybody here know that Jesus will make your enemies back up? God says, they'll come at you one way. They'll flee from you seven ways. When they rise up to defame you and defeat you, when they rise up to denounce and disgrace you, God says, I'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Anybody know God will show you favor in the presence of your enemies? And I can tell you myself, I, 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 I'm going to tell, I'm going to ask God, just help me say this right. If ever you have been defrauded, as I have been by a fast talking church going con artist as I have been have I got a promise from God for you it's found in Isaiah chapter 61 verse 6 and 7 God says instead of your shame you will receive a double portion what a promise from God Instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance and you will inherit a double portion. Listen to this from the servant of the Lord. Here's what Ellen White says. And this, 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 this touched me. She says, if in your power you would advantage yourself at your neighbor's disadvantage. She says, every dollar which comes to you in this manner will carry with it a curse. She said it is a curse which you will feel sooner or later. She said God marks every act of injustice, be it done to believer or unbeliever, and he will not pass it over. You know, even Jesus was the victim of a thief. So don't worry. You just claim Isaiah 61. God says, you know what it says? I'll give you double for your trouble. And Ellen White also says, I will help. God says, I will help you in every emergency. Check this out. She said, when a soul is in discouragement, Jesus sends help from heaven even before the prayer for help is uttered. I was coming in years ago on a little small private plane from Seattle to Spokane and we were coming into land, it was dark and raining and, and we crashed. The only plane crash I've been in, I've been able to walk away from it. But we crashed on the tarmac. The FAA investigated and found out that the pilot had forgotten to put the wheels down. And we came in and slammed into the concrete. They said that we could have gone up in a ball of flames with the sparks and the fuel. Uh, they said, but we probably, that didn't happen to us because it was raining so heavenly, so heavily. But, but that's what they said happened. Can I tell you what happened? I was coming in on that plane, talking to the Lord. I'm telling you, God sends help before you even utter the prayer. The Bible says when they come upon you to eat up your flesh, they will stumble and fall. The Lord will put to shame them that hate you. That's what my Bible says. And so that day, that day, Jesus began writing in the dust a diagram of their guilt, the details of their misconduct, and when some of the nosy folks try to lean in to see what was being written, you know, there are those with hot Instagram accounts. Watch it when they lean in. <laughs> they just might post what they read. Jesus swept away the record of the sins of that woman's accusers. Uh, you know, I, 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 I can't stay on this long, but, but I love that big gospel hit. You know it keep your business off of Facebook. 
You never heard it? Go, go to YouTube. <laughs> but believe me, if you're smart, you'll listen to that song. Yeah? Jesus brushed away the sand, the record of the sins of the Pharisees, and then he looked at that woman and said to her, what happened? Woman, where are your accusers? Jesus knew where they were. He was asking for her benefit. He was asking so she could start rehearsing her testimony. <laughs> are you listening to me today? Woman, where are your accusers? Have no man condemned thee. She said, no man, Lord. No man has condemned me. Church, one of my favorite quotations. I love it. It says, love may be silent, but gratitude must speak. Gratitude must speak. Has no man condemned thee? No man, Lord, she said. No man has condemned me. Well, said Jesus, neither do I condemn thee. And then Jesus said to that woman, the words that are forming the title of my message today, words that altered the trajectory of her life. Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. This word from Jesus, go and sin no more, was not a suggestion. It was not a timid request. It was not an offer of a recommendation. Go and sin no more. It was not an option over which we have the power to exercise personal preference. Jesus wasn't saying, uh, you, you know, uh, he wasn't saying, you know, I was thinking that, <laughs> that, that maybe, you know, perhaps you, you, you might consider. Oh, no, this was a glorious invitation to a radical change. It was a glorious invitation to a radical change. And today Jesus invites every sinner to live a life of radical change. And just like he said to that woman, he says to all of us today, go and sin no more. There's no ambiguity here. There's no uncertainty, no lack of clarity here. He said what he meant. And he meant what he said. When he said go, and sin no more. He didn't say, you're a sinner, and so I expect you to sin. That's the modern theologians talking. That's not Jesus talking. He didn't say, I understand it's in your DNA. Don't stress yourself. Don't expect, I don't expect anything more from you than sinning. No, Jesus said, Go and sin no more. Jesus was saying, don't go back to that nasty habit that has messed up your life. That behavior that leaves you feeling guilty and naked. Go and sin no more. There's nothing back there for you but death, hell, and destruction anyway. When Jesus gives you victory over habit, don't go back. Leave somebody say hallelujah. It's, the Bible says like a dog returning to his vomit, like a clean pig going to the mud. The servant of the Lord tells us in that moment, that woman knew if she accepted the invitation of Jesus, that she would experience radical change and that her life would never be the same. Her life would change forever. In that moment, that woman knew she was never going back to that life of sin and pain and transgression. And for anybody here today who's tired of being a pawn of the devil, God sent me to talk to you today. 
If you're tired of being manipulated and kicked around like a slave, if you for the next few minutes just listen with another spirit, you will hear in those words, go and sin no more. A glorious invitation to spiritual growth. If you listen with another spirit, you'll hear Jesus welcoming, welcoming you to a radical new way of living. You know, like that man who used to frequent the nightclubs, gave his life to Jesus. One day he was walking in the neighborhood. A woman of the night called out to him. Hey! And he turned the other, other way. He kept walking. She shouted, hey, baby, it's me. He shouted back, but it's not me no more. Jesus said, go and sin no more. Now, I want you to know, I, I never thought we would come to a time when those words would be controversial. Theologically controversial. Hear these words. People hear these words often only as a command, but not as an invitation. I read a story of a little boy on the steps of a building. He was blind. He had his hat out. And he had a sign that said, I'm blind, please help. There were only a few coins in his hat, and a man was walking by. He took a few coins from his pocket, dropped them in the hat, and then he took the boy's sign, turned it around, and wrote some words, put the sign back so that everybody who walked by could see what he had written. And soon the hat just began to fill up with money. A lot more people were giving money to the blind boy. And that afternoon, the man who had changed the sign came by to see how things were going. The boy recognized his footsteps and he says, were you the one that changed my sign this morning? Yes. He said, well, what did you write? The man said, I only wrote the truth. I, I said what you said, but in a different way. He said, I wrote, today is a beautiful day, but I cannot see it. When you hear, go and sin no more. You need to hear Jesus welcoming you to a life of radical change. Now I must tell you, I, I, I love that song, We Fall Down But We Get Up. It's a great song, brilliant song, but I think it needs one more verse. We fall down and we get up and by God's grace, we're going to stay up. If you're tired of falling down and getting up and I'm talking not everybody, but I'm talking to somebody here today. If you're tired of falling down and getting up and falling down and getting up and you want to embrace as a gift from Jesus this radical change. He'll give you the power to get up and stay up. When those old black sisters would pray for the preacher, they would shout out in church, stand up in him, Jesus. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I'm talking about a radical change. Here's what the servant of the Lord says. She said, Jesus Christ desires to live his life in you, perfecting your character. And when you let Jesus live out his life in you, perfecting your character, you will see radical change. One of the most radical servants of God I've ever met was Elder E.E. E. Cleveland. That's a man I love. And I used to travel with him and do crusades. And I would sing. And one day he said to me, hey, Phipps. <laughs> uh, sometimes I like to talk like him. You know? he, he said, Phipps, I've learned how to pray every hour on the hour. And I, I was young man 18 years old I said wow I, I gotta try that too and I would try to remember every time the hour came around I found it hard then I went out and bought some a digital watch that would vibrate every hour on the hour it would remind me to just pause and pray and 
And, and after about three or four years of that vibrating on my arm, I realized that I was not only praying on the hour, but I was praying in the hour and before the hour. And I had developed a faith that was anchored in constant communion with God. Here's what the servant of the Lord says. She says, Ellen White says, no radical change will be seen or wrought in your life and character unless you depend upon the grace of Christ every hour. Every hour. And so because I wanted to live that kind of life, a radical, yeah, yeah, somebody, you got to pray in every hour and hour. That's kind of radical. Because I, but I wanted that life. So I went and I built an app. You, you, I'll tell you about it, the name of it at the end. I don't want you to be distracted right now. But <laughs> I built an app to help me live a life of hourly communion with God. And you can set your quiet times when you sleep so it doesn't alarm or alert you during those hours. But all through the day, every hour you'll get a thought from Ellen White. You'll get a thought from Steps to Christ. You'll get a thought from any book in the Bible that you've chosen. And it used to have a cost with it, but now it's free. And, I, I, and I'm going to tell you about it. Ellen White says, listen what Ellen White says. She says, our only safety is in living in hourly communion with God. And so... If you want to get a little radical in your faith today, I invite you to join me in a new way of living, a life of hourly contact and communion with God. The servant of the Lord says, we, we, we would not commit sin if we realized the presence of God and thought upon his goodness, his love, and his compassion church I can tell you that hourly communion with God that radical step and I'm trying to call you I'm trying to call you to a new radical step it will help you destroy any bad habit that has held you a slave and I know what I'm talking about I'm not talking about what I heard I'm talking about what I know hourly communion with God is the most powerful way to grow your spiritual life I have a, a, a swimming pool at my home with pavers around it. And for almost 20 years, I struggled with weeds growing up through the pavers around my enclosed, enclosed pool area. I tried everything to kill those weeds. I tried round up, bust up, tear up, rip up, <laughs> any kind of up you can imagine. I almost gave up. But I'd, I'd pull those weeds and they'd just keep coming back. I, I did not know that weeds, weeds have the ability to grow in almost any soil. Yeah. Woo! And if you don't kill the nodes that sprout the roots. <laughs> did you hear what I said? Yeah. Weeds have the ability to develop new roots. <laughs> and if you don't kill the nodes that sprout the roots, the weeds will just keep growing back. And for 20 years, 20 years, anybody struggle with a habit for 20 years? For 20 years, I've been messing up my back, pulling up those weeds. Did you know that weeds are like a bad habit? <laughs> they can grow in any soil, young soil, old soil, fertile soil, soil with no promise. And then one day God said to me, have you noticed? that no weeds grow along the beach. That's because weeds can't live in soil that is saturated with salt. Put salt on your weeds 
When they hit the roots and the nodes, those weeds will shrivel up and die. So armed with that revelatory thought. <laughs> I said armed with that revelatory thought from God. I knew I had the answer to my weed problem. And, and because I don't live too far from the ocean, I took a few empty buckets when my wife wasn't there looking to ask me what in the world am I doing. Hey, are you with me today? Sometimes you got to do stuff when nobody's looking now. I went down to the ocean and I, I filled up those buckets with salt water from the sea. I brought the water back and I poured it down every crack in my pavers. And because for 20 years I've been fighting this weed problem, because I finally wanted to be rid of those weeds forever, I went down to Lowe's. I bought some pool salt. And I mixed that pool salt in some water to pour it on top of the ocean salt. Hey, when you're desperate, Lord have mercy. And I poured, I poured that salty water in between every crack in the pavers around my pool. Well, it's been a few weeks now. And I guess I don't have to tell you. Those weeds have dried up. And it looks like they're gone forever. I haven't seen a hair of a weed or a breath of a weed. And, but I got to tell you one disclaimer. Just don't do that near your favorite flowers. Because they're not coming back. If there's anybody here today who's got a weed problem. Yeah, that kind of weed too. If you have any, if anybody... Anybody here today got a weed problem? If you got sinful habits growing up through the cracks in your Christian experience, I got a solution for you. It is hourly, unbroken contact and communion with God. It works. It'll kill. Here's what Ellen White says. She said, we got all kinds of weeds growing up in, in our, she said, pride is a wheel. She said, yeah, listen, listen to poisonous weeds. She said, she says, impatience is a weed. She said, dissension and selfishness is a weed. She said, envy is a weed. Mm. Lord, help my neighbors to stop buying things I can't afford. That's a weed. Passion, stubbornness. She says, stubbornness is a weed. Alienation. She says, prejudice is a weed. She says, jealousy is a weed. And if you want to kill those weeds in your life, you got to mix this solution together and you got to pray, study God's word, and every hour, talk to your Jesus. After you mix that solution together, you're going to have to pour it into every crack where the weeds of your bad habits, just anybody got bad habits, just keep coming back. saturate those cracks and if by chance you run across a really stubborn weed you know you got your time enough for it now because you got the solution pour some faithfulness no amen I'm calling to somebody to a radical change I remember when the aliens we used to, went to Oakland, California. Our first trip out there, and we went to Love Center. And we were there at Walter Hawkins Church, and he said, I got a little song that I've written. We haven't recorded it yet. And then Tremaine came out. And she sang this song. And so I asked the choir, Get that song ready for me today. And 
I'm calling to somebody. The Holy Spirit is calling somebody to a life of radical change. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if you didn't hear anything I said, if you commit yourself to hourly communion with God, you're going to see a change. You're going to see radical, radical change. Sing it for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. A change, my Jesus. A change has come over yes. me.
Bow your heads with me just for a moment. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for the outpouring of your spirit. Thank you for this call to a radical change. Ellen White says that, that, that 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 woman who was caught that woman who was caught in adultery she says her life was so changed she says and what says she became one of the most steadfast loyal faithful followers of Jesus servant of God says she became a dedicated, committed servant of God. And I love this. She says that that woman repaid his forgiveness with faithfulness. Oh, hallelujah, God. What a God we serve. If we change our trajectory, he gives us grace credit. He gives us grace, credit for maturity we haven't reached yet. And so today, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I just came by. I asked the Holy Ghost to help somebody who needs to see a radical change. And today, Jesus is saying to you, just like he said to that woman, go and sin no more. He's offering you radical power and so my brother my sister whoever you are if there is some part of your life the devil has been messing with for years and years and like weeds it kept growing and coming back and coming back today today Jesus offers you radical change and if you want to say thank you Jesus for this change I'm embracing by faith I want you to stand on your feet and I want you to come down to this altar for a word of prayer if you want that radical change something that the devil has had over you holding on to you <laughs> made you a slave stand up and come for a word of prayer right now come right now Mm, as they sing, come right now. Oh, one. Come right now. A wonderful change. Come right now. You're making a decision for a radical change. Not only is he offering you change, he's, asked, he's offering you the power to sustain that change. Hallelujah, God. Not only is he offering you change, he's offering you the power to sustain that change. If you're one of those folks who needs to make an extra step to be baptized, you know who you are. God knows who you are. He's speaking to you even now. Just raise your hand and say, the change I need, I need to get baptized. I need to go down into the watery grave of baptism. There's a hand over there. 
If there's somebody else want to, I want to be baptized. Just raise your hand wherever you are. Wherever you are. Oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you something before we leave today. One of the most amazing experiences I've ever had in my life. I was asked to sing for the Maryland Shock Trauma Banquet in Baltimore. They were honoring a man, a young boy really, who was trying to cross the street and looked the wrong way and he was struck and killed. The family donated all of his organs. But there was one man named Richard Lee Norris. I'll never forget meeting him. I've got a picture with him. Some years before, he was cleaning out his gun case and, and there was an accident and he shot off his face with this gun. He was disfigured for the rest of his life. His face was twisted. He had to wear a covering over his face to go out in public. Well, that night at the banquet, I saw this with my own eyes. They brought out someone who received that young boy. His name was Jacob, received his heart. And he came, just a parade of people who had received pancreas and, and, and liver but the family did something really really radical they donated their son's face I saw this with myself or myself they donated the son's face to the young man who had had that accident with the gun and that young man walked out to thank the family with the face of their son who had died. I'm, I'm not telling you something I heard. I'm telling you something I saw. But what blew me away was he went to the microphone. The family not only donated his face, they donated their son's jaw and his tongue. And that young man went to the microphone to say thank you with the tongue that was donated. Well, I want you to know, my brother, my sister, the Lord will change you He'll give you a new tongue. You're not going to talk the way you used to talk. He'll give you a new face. He'll give you joy in your spirit. He'll give you radical change. Commit yourself. And, and, and I promised you, I'll tell you what the name of the app is. You can go and when you sit down, you'll be able to pull it up. It's called Divine Alerts. You can get it in your Android. You get it in your, in your iPhone. Just download Divine Alerts. And every hour on the hour. Woo! I've been using it for years. It's made a difference in my life. It, it is, it's helped me. As a matter of fact, when I'm not communing on the hour, Ellen White is right. I'm in danger. She said, you in danger. And so this is, the, this is how I'm going to live the rest of my life with this radical change. And I, and I invite you to join me. Let's pray. For, Pastor, will you come pray for us? Pray for us. Our Father, we thank you for speaking to us today. And more than and for more than words, we're grateful for the yearning 
that has been created in the soul for you. We came down front, we stood to our feet, not just because we're nearing the end of the service, but just in acknowledgement that without you, we can do nothing. So Father, as we recommit ourselves to you, we are praying for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we are committing ourselves not just to the downloading of an app or for a shift for a day or 48 hours, but Lord, we are wanting to see you do a work that changes the rest of our days on this earth. So Lord, we heard your word. Lord, some of us have been entertaining sin, making excuses for it, justifying it, or even misusing the principles of grace to keep it close to us. But Lord, we heard your word. And so Lord, we're not just going to limit it to the confession of sin. But Lord, we're going to leave this place and forsake some sin. So Lord, as we commit ourselves to daily dependence upon you we know the change is not it's not our change but it's you in us so lord would you simply come in lord we we, we lift hands and say lord come in lord we open up both doors of the heart and we say come in lord 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 we stand to our feet and say come in Lord, as I say it from the mic, as the body of Christ, just shout, Jesus, come in. Shout, Holy Spirit, come in. We welcome you in. We can't make it without you. Come in. And Lord, as you enter in, we know, Father, that you will change everything. Lord, from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet. Lord, would you begin it not with just with the hands or with earrings or lipstick, but let it start with the heart, Lord. Lord, would you pull up those weeds, pride, impatience, prejudice, intemperance, selfishness, stubbornness. Lord, pull it up, Lord. Not just at the roots, Lord, but would you destroy the nodes, oh God, so that they cannot come back again. Do a new thing in us. Do a new thing for us. And we will keep our hands in yours until that change comes. Bless your people. Please bless your servant in a mighty way. We pray these blessings in the holy name of Jesus. Let all of those who are embracing this change say amen. Let them shout hallelujah to the Lamb of God.